My name is Cara Gabriel. I'm a theater professor in the Department of Performing <coughs> Arts. And I'm Carl Coppola. Um, me too. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we're here today to talk to you about the performing professor. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Okay, raise your hand if you can't because I will, I will use the microphone, although I would rather, I'd rather not if I can get away with not using it. Um, so we're going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover and I want to make sure that we leave a couple of minutes at the end for questions. Should anyone have any questions? The first person I'd like to speak to you about is a man named Michael Chekhov. And Michael Chekhov is the nephew of the famous playwright Anton Chekhov, if you've ever heard of him. Um, Michael Chekhov is the, the lesser known nephew, and he is, or he was, I should say, a theater practitioner. He was an actor, he was a director, and he was also an acting teacher. Um, I, I love Anton Chekhov for a number of reasons, but one of my favorite reasons is that he really talks about, he devotes a lot of time to entering the space and entering the performance space. And he speaks about this literally and he speaks about it metaphorically. But um, he, he has a principle of which we are going to practice here today, but that principle is the principle of entering, breathing, and being still. So he says that when it is time for an actor to begin their work, they cross a metaphorical threshold and the work begins. So if you're like me, um, and everyone is always sort of surprised when they hear this, but I have a lot of anxiety about public speaking, despite having a history as an actor and an acting teacher. Every time I go to teach a class, my pulse uh, races and I feel anxiety. This is a class of people who I don't know. It's my colleagues. It's not my students. And so what I do is I prepare myself to enter the space. And Michael Chekhov also talks about entering with impact. And here's what I want to tell you. A person can enter with impact. <laughs> <laughs> of the scene. So as a professor, when you enter a room to teach, you can either choose to make a literal entrance and change the beat of the scene, or you can make a metaphorical entrance. Good morning. Right? And now I'm entering the scene. You can cross the threshold literally, and here I am or you can cross the threshold metaphorically. And we're ready to work. Entering with impact allows you to take control of a space. The reason taking control of a space is important is because you can't give control of the space to your students until you have control of the space as a professor. You can't make the space a safe space for your students to learn until you first have control of the space as a professor. And the first and most important way to take control of that space is through your entrance. Your entrance into the scene, your entrance into the lecture, your entrance into the classroom. So I want you to pay attention to the way that you enter the scene or you enter the space. Actors do not begin acting when they begin speaking. Likewise, professors do not begin teaching when the lecture begins. If you've ever gone to see a show and there are actors on stage before they begin speaking, you are already developing assumptions about those characters. You're developing assumptions about them from their costume. You're developing assumptions about them from the way they carry themselves. You're developing assumptions about them from the way they're interacting with other people in the scene. So know that as a professor, your performance begins before your text begins. You are already present in the scene. The moment your students can see you, you are present in the scene. 
the action of building your character or building your persona as a professor begins the moment your audience or your students can see you. Entering. Now let's talk about breathing. Everyone take a nice deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. It's good to breathe. Breath is life. Breath is speech. You cannot speak to a room full of students if you are forgetting to breathe. Students will wait for you to breathe. Taking a moment to pause and breathe is perfectly fine. It's perfectly acceptable. A student asks you a question and you need a moment to think about what the answer to that question is, breathe. Your brain needs oxygen. Your body needs a moment to collect itself, to set itself right so you can answer the question. Michael Chekhov told us we must enter, breathe, and be still. You may take a moment of stillness before you begin your lecture. Give yourself permission to exist in stillness and to exist in silence before the speech and voice come. Again, all of this allows you to gain control of the room, to gain control of the space, can gain, to gain control of your body, and to gain control of your voice. Everything about your presentation will be clearer if you breathe and you, if you allow yourself to exist in stillness. The final thing I'm going to tell you about Michael Chekhov is that he talked about the principle of radiating and receiving. To radiate and to receive. In that moment of stillness and breath, you are radiating an energy to everyone in the room. And if you are in tune with everyone in the room, you are also receiving a particular energy from everyone in the room. You might have heard the famous quip that acting is reacting. That's one of the things we tell our students, all good actors, you're not acting in a vacuum, you're reacting to what the other actors are doing in the scene around you. Likewise, all professors, all good professors, must necessarily react to what is being given to them from the students in their classroom. You are radiating something to your students, they are receiving it, and they're radiating something back to you, and you must receive it, and you must act upon what they are giving you. Now, if that's all a little bit too um, vague, a little too abstract, I'm going to pass it over to Carl, and he's going to make that all a bit more concrete for you and talk about what exactly we are radiating and how to receive it and how to respond. Yeah, uh, so now we're going to get to the um, person who's kind of considered to be the father of modern acting theory, a uh, man named Konstantin Stanislavski. Um, now, you may have heard of Stanislavski through something called the method, or method acting, um, which is a, a kind of an odd, limited view of Stanislavski through the lens of the mid-20th century American acting training. Um, not all people who follow the techniques of Stanislavski are method actors. And in fact, I would say probably in contemporary actors, um, their method is really not one of the strong, dominant modes of active training anymore. Though there are a couple of uh, very famous and successful um, exceptions to that. But uh, almost all actors who, uh, who study and employ a technique in their acting follow some version of Stanislavski. Now, one of the most common things um, when people are nervous about acting or their public speaking or teaching, one of the things that they're told is to be yourself. Um, and that really gets back to uh, one of the 
the primary tenets of the Stanislavski system. Um, well, our public persona and our private persona, sometimes those may vary. Uh, who we are at home in our personal life as opposed to who we are when we're on stage or who we are when we step into a classroom, those may be different. But if they vary too greatly, then the, your audience <laughs> or your class is going to view that as somehow dishonest. Um, and Stanislavski preached the idea of truth and emotional honesty in your acting, or at least um, what's called verisimilitude, the appearance of truth, uh, which is the next best thing to being truthful. Um, so you'll be at your best in your teaching if you allow yourself to, sh yourself to shine through. Um, or you have to really act really well. Um, uh, as Spencer Tracy um, said, um, acting is great. Just don't let anybody catch you at it. Um, so as long as you, when nobody is aware that you're putting on a persona, they believe it as true, then it's true. All right. Some people will refer to the idea of uh, being yourself as <coughs> typing or typecasting. <coughs> And now this is the equivalent of saying that when you, you go after certain roles, you're going to go after roles that are um, how people perceive you, what that first impression is of you. And that's really true, especially for, for things like film acting, um, where you get sort of the, the idea of, oh, we know exactly who that person is as soon as we see them up here on screen or as soon as we see them walk out on stage. Um, it's important that we understand sort of how you harness your own unique gifts as an actor and as a professor. Are you funny? Um, do you have a great vocabulary? Are you relatable? Are you powerful? Are you passionate? You need to play to your personal strengths. Um, to thine own self be true. Somebody like that. Okay. Uh, next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of an objective. Um, when you walk on stage or enter into a classroom, you have to know what you want or what you need. Stanislavski taught that on stage an actor must always be doing something. <coughs> and always pursuing an objective. Um, actors are trained to make their objectives as specific as possible. Uh, in our syllabi, which I know are fully complete and copied and all ready to go for next week, um, in our syllabi, we, we have sort of the course objectives. Stanislavski would talk about that idea as a super objective, what a character wants over the course of the entire play. Um, so like in, uh, in the gen ed class that I'm teaching, um, I want the students to understand the ways in which Broadway musicals reflect, embrace, challenge, subvert, and shape American society and identities. That's one of my, my primary course objective for a gen ed class. However, I can't walk into the first day of class and that's what I'm going to do. It's too big. It's too general. And so what I have to do is I have to break each class into um, smaller objectives. And the idea of having little manageable goals that, when examined holistically over 15 weeks, ultimately are going to lead me to that super objective. So specificity is the key when identifying your objective. It's not enough to say when you walk into a classroom, I'm going to inspire them. Ah, to do what? Um, if you could achieve a physical goal at the end of that scene, or at the end of the speech, or at the end of the lecture, or at the end of the class, or at the end of this group activity, what would it be? What would that physical goal be? What would they understand or achieve? What would they do uh, when you complete it? And how will you measure your success in achieving that objective? How would you know if you had met it? Um, so how maybe you... Uh, to inspire them becomes something like to inspire every student in this room to go see a professional musical on their own before the end of the semester. That's going to be my goal over this next 15 minute section of my class. And then you have to decide how you're going to measure that success. Okay, another example uh, of a weak objective is to get them to listen. Um, again, this is weak because it's hard to measure and it's a little bit too abstract. How will you know whether they're actually listening? because they could just be acting too. Um, and what will listening get you at the end? There needs to be a point to what it is. Um, uh, an actor, one of the actor's favorite objectives is um, to get, I'm gonna get her to fall in love with me. Actors love to play that. It's really not a playable objective, however. In class, we sort of think about, okay, I'm gonna get them to love musical theater, or I'm gonna get them to love inorganic chemistry, or I'm gonna get them to love tort reform. Um, <laughs> And, and, of course, we want them to love the, the subjects, of course. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But how are you going to measure it? How are you going to achieve that? So in the theater, we make sure that there's a concrete result.
that our actor and our character can envision. If I am successful in my objective, the other character will exit the room and never come back. Hopefully that is not our teaching objective. Um, so, think about sort of what your objective is for the class when you walk in. Do you want people to participate vigorously? Do you want them to raise their hand and ask questions? Are there three specific pieces of information you want them to remember above all else? Do you want them to employ critical thinking to challenge their assumptions about a specific issue? Uh, do you want to reach that one bored kid in the back? Uh, do you want them to make a connection between the material in this lecture and something in another class? Do you want them to email you or come meet with you after class? Um, if you've ever thought to yourself before you teach a class, I, I don't know what I'm doing today in class. On some level, but yet, of course, you, you know what you're doing. You know what material you plan to cover. But ultimately, you haven't given yourself a strong, specific objective or outcome for that day. So you feel a little bit lost. So if I don't have a strong, clear idea of what I want the students to take away from that class that day, I am failing. So pursuing an objective takes the focus off of you and puts it squarely on the other person. How are you going to transform that other person? I'm going to talk about obstacles because if we didn't have any obstacles, then there wouldn't be any conflict and our students would already know all of the things that we are trying to teach them and they'd all already be fully engaged and uh, we would have no fears about what we're doing and how. So, um, so I'm going to talk just for a brief moment about obstacles. I don't want to dwell on them. An obstacle can be an internal obstacle or it can be an external obstacle. And depending on which is stronger, that may change the way that you perceive your objective for the day. An external obstacle is something like uh, all of the students failed their last quiz, right? So my objective needs to change. Something in the way that I'm conveying the material or the speed with which I'm conveying the material needs to change. That's something that's happening externally. An internal obstacle can be something like, I had a horrible weekend, my dog died, and I can't focus on what it is I'm about to teach these students, or I'm terrified in front of them, or whatever it is. That's something that's happening internally, and that's something that you as a professor or an actor have to deal with in order to get past it to then deal with the business of, of the day, the class in front of you. So there can be an internal obstacle or an external obstacle. Sometimes there are both. And whatever those are, those are going to have an impact on, on the way that you perceive and construct your objective. Uh, your tactics combined make up your strategy. So at the top you have your objective. <coughs> This is the thing that I want or need at the very most today, above all else. This is where my stakes are very high. Below that, you have your obstacle. This is what's in the way. This is what's holding me back from a, a, achieving that objective. And then below that, you have a list or series of tactics that comprise your strategy to achieve that objective. Objective, obstacle, and tactics, which make up your strategy. Tactics are the best if you can define them as a verb in the infinitive form. They are even better and stronger if they're a verb that you can define in the infinitive form that you could somehow, if forced, physicalize. To beg. Yes? I was just going to ask you for a I'm, I'm going to give you some, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm going to even do them for you. <laughs> so, for example, to beg. I'll go through a few, and then I'll do them. Maybe Carl will do some, too. <laughs> to pummel. To drill. To seduce. 
to level with. Okay? Um, someone give me a line of text. It doesn't have to be a, a course line of text, like something from a course you teach, anything. Um, will you go sit in that chair right there? Is that my text? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to beg. Will you go sit in that chair right there? <laughs> to pummel. Will you go sit in that chair right there? <laughs> to drill. Will you go sit in that chair right there? There. <laughs> to seduce. Will you go sit in that chair right there? <laughs> <laughs> Will you go sit in that chair right there? Okay, so um, you're obviously not going to get physical with your students, but you can do all of these things vocally as well. It makes your lecture more interesting. It brings humor, levity, variation to what you're doing, right? And it gives you a way of expressing the same point multiple ways so that it will affect and inspire and whatever your objective is, different students, different types of students. <coughs> you may not, as an actor or as a professor, act happy as a tactic, nor may you be interesting. Can anyone tell me why you can't act happy, sad, or interesting, or be happy, sad, or interesting? Why is that different from to pummel, to beg, to drill? Yeah. Yes, right? It's a state of being. It's not active. It's not a verb in the infinitive form. What I tell my acting students is that being is boring. You may not be a certain way because how do I how do I be interesting? <laughs> you know, like I, I'm interesting, but that's not going to help get anything through to my gen ed students, right? Be interesting. I don't know what that means. How specifically are you going to be interesting? Are you going to be interesting by chiding them? Are you going to be interesting by mocking them? Are you going to be interesting by raising them up? Right? What does that mean to be a certain way? We're more interested in the business of how you're going to be interesting. And the how is achieved through finding those verbs in the infinitive form. It also doesn't do you any good to act a certain way. I'm going to enter and act happy, right? That goes back to this idea of verisimilitude. Most of us, if we're feeling blue, right? Um, there, I was being blue, see? Nice. It, it's ineffective. No one's gonna believe you unless you're a brilliant actor. It's okay to live your truth as a human being and also be a professor, within reason, right? Within reason. Obviously, there are boundaries that you want to adhere to, but it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to live your truth to a certain extent. You don't need to enter the room and be happy if you're not. That's okay. You don't need to be wretched, right? But, but live your truth. That's okay. Enter, breathe, be still and get down to the business of what your objective is for the day. Make it about them. 
Because all of those tactics that I had, not a single one was about me. Teaching at its best isn't about you. It's about them. Just like acting at its best isn't about actors who are being, you know, overcome with something. No one cares to watch that. We know they're faking. It's not about them. It's about what are they doing to the other person in the scene? What are we doing to the other people in the room? The great thing about that is it also takes the pressure off of you. It's not about me being brilliant today. No one cares. And it really draws you back to that idea of that radiating and receiving that you talked about before. If, if, if your focus is on, are, are they understanding this? Is this point getting across? Are they responding in the way that I'm hoping they will? Then if that's what you need from them, then your focus is going to be entirely upon, okay, is that actually happening? What energy am I getting back from these people? If they're giving you the, the bored stares or if they are texting on their phone, you're probably not achieving that objective, which means you need to shift your tactic and do it in a different way. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, I was going to talk about the bond. What time is it? We're almost halfway through. <coughs> okay. okay. Um, I can do this pretty quickly, though. Sure. I, I'm going to throw out one more um, theorist only because the way that he talks about movement actually helps us understand tactics. This is, um, this is Rudolf Laban, L-A-B-A-N. Uh, and he was actually a Hungarian dancer and, and theorist. Uh, but I use him in some of the courses that I teach because he came up with a series of what he called movement efforts. And the way that he defined these movement efforts are a really quick and easy way to help students understand what a tactic is. They're very instinctive and, um, and they're easy to remember. They are to press, to slash, to float, to flick, to dab, to glide, to thrust, and to ring. Ring, like ringing. Ring their necks. No, don't do that. Um, I was thinking of ringing a washcloth. Uh, and he qualifies those movement efforts by things like, is it fast or slow? Is it direct or indirect? Is it light or strong? And these are all ways that we can define our tactics, that we can define the ways in which we're going to get across to our students. There are tons of websites and books that help actors identify what active tactics are. Um, because sometimes when an actor or professor is put on the spot and you say, come up with an active tactic, they freeze. They kind of panic about that. They don't know what that means. It's hard to come up on the spot with a verb in the infinitive form. So I come back to Rudolf Lebon's movement efforts because there are a few of them, again, that are pretty quick to, to memorize. And they're easy to sort of grab onto and use them if, if your mind is failing you somehow. Um, again, they're press, slash, float, flick, dab, glide, thrust, and ring. I'm ready for our exercise. Mm -hmm. Great, so we will have time to have questions. Oh, shoot. Yes, let's do that while this is warming up. Um, so there, there are many of you, and this room is an auditorium, which really doesn't allow for us to have much uh, in the way of physical action. But I would love if everyone would, um, would do a little entering, breathing, and being still with us. So the way that we're going to do that, again, remember I said it can be a metaphorical entrance. It doesn't have to be a literal entrance. So your entrance is really just going to be the act of standing up. You're going to, when you stand, you're going to breathe in a moment of stillness. 
and then introduce yourself. And we'll do it as a whole group. We're not going to go around each person. There are just too many of us, and, and we want to get to some other um, more, more fun activities. But I would love it if everyone would enter, breathe, and be still together. Kara Gabriel. <laughs> okay. That was awkward. That was awkward. <laughs> that was really awkward. Yeah. Should we demonstrate it again? No. We just, we just need to. We're uh, going to live our truth and oh, yeah. just exist in the awkwardness of that for a yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. Super. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I uh, think about uh, uh, in connecting the breath is um, it's very easy for us to think about when we consciously think about breathing is we all of a sudden forget how to breathe. We, we make it about, when I ask my five-year-old son to breathe when he's uh, mad, um, that's what he does. He will go, <gasps> um, this actually has nothing to do with breathing, this part right here. Because um, the breath actually comes from down here. Notice it, we also tend to think about um, with cl clavicle breathing, which is like these really short, little shallow breaths. And those are panicked breaths. Those are breaths of panic. They allow you to hyperventilate. She told me to introduce myself. What if I'm the first one and no one else is speaking? <gasps> yeah. um, so you want to think about taking in a full breath. And, and, you, uh, and while it doesn't actually work this way, thinking about a breath that fills your entire body. Um, and if you, have, like, if you are feeling tension in some part of your body, oh. if you think about allowing your breath to reach that part, <laughs> Frequently, that tension will release itself. Um, because the body is very, very good at repairing itself. And one of the primary ways it does that is through breath. So, what we're going to do is we'll try it all let's, together. Let's just breathe, yeah. We'll stand. And we're all going to breathe, so okay? Get out through the mouth. If there's an area of tension in your body, I would love for your breath to fill that particular area. And as you exhale, exhale all of the tension from that area. If you're standing with your knees locked in place, if you unlock your knees, you will breathe better. And you'll also be better, more grounded. Um, you will appear more confident. If you're standing with your hands like this, you probably, if you're standing with your hands like this, you probably have tension in your hands or your shoulders or your belly. If you're standing with your neck like this, you probably have tension in your neck. Yeah. Okay, everyone breathe in. to one, you're going to introduce yourselves. You can breathe again first. It's up to you. Take control of the space. That is your objective with your introduction. Take control of the space so you can give it back to us. Three, two, one. Carl Cipolla. Cara Gabriel. Did you take control of the space? It was very quiet. <laughs> Here's our next little exercise. This will be more fun. You can sit down. Okay, this says press here to sit. Let's try. Lord help us. Oh God. I don't know. I've done it. So I pulled it up on the laptop. Is that wrong? Is that incorrect? Yeah. Do we have handouts? Did you give them to me? So we have hard copies for this reason. I, technology, yes. <laughs> There's my truth. OK. Um, this is an exercise. We have, we have drafted a lecture for you. 
And you are all going to teach the class today how to make, yeah, is there a way to, this is on our blackboard section too. You're going, you're going to teach the class how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, and you're going to do this in groups of three to four. So we'll hand this out, and if you would gather in groups of three to four, we will tell you what your next steps are. So the very first thing you're going to do with your lecture is you're going to divide it into three sections or beats. Think beginning, middle, and end. There is no right or wrong answer to this. It's really where you feel a natural beginning, middle, and end are in this very important lecture. That's your first step. Oh, more copies? Yeah. Yeah, one per group or up here. I don't know. Can you see this okay? It's very... Mm. There, we have a couple more copies, though, if people want. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yes. This is your text. This is your text. So this is your script. This would be the lecture you're giving to the class today. There will be, <laughs> they can adjust, I mean, they can adjust. Yeah, you can adjust the text. It's your lecture. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Wendy Melillo. How is everyone doing today? Good. Good? Is everybody hungry by any chance? <laughs> We're approaching the lunch hour. <laughs> Today, I would like to tell you our objectives. We would like to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So, the first thing we need to do is to gather our ingredients. What do we need for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? That's an interesting twist. I might like to try that. What else do we need? Peanut butter. Peanut butter? Bread. Bread? Jelly. You don't want to make it on a bagel? Or some crackers? A knife. I wrote down for obstacles for getting the knife. I just thought I'd throw that out there. I used it as an internal obstacle. I'm afraid of knives. I wrote as my internal obstacle, I'm starving. Mm -hmm. That's what I wrote dislike of for the internal right? Or allergy. <laughs> for the second um, tactic, it was execute, make the sandwich, to make. Mm -hmm. I down make the sandwich. So if we forgot the knife, what are you going to have to do? We're going to get really creative with our fingers, right? Are you going to lick your fingers and then put it back in the peanut butter or jelly? Yes. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, hygiene is so hot. We just read right about dirt being good for us. It's like leading to these new antibiotics, you know? So let's not worry about dirt. And number three, to choose. Do you want this to be nutritional or not? Since we're putting our fingers back in there, maybe we don't want it to be nutritional. Anything else? That's my performance. Good 
Christian. Two pieces of bread in a perfect towel. <laughs> a peanut butter and jelly should be pressed kissing. Cut the sandwich in half. <laughs> you may cut the sandwich lengthwise, rectangles, or diagonally into triangles. This is an artistic process, an advanced students may experiment with. Based on the ingredients you choose, the bread and spreads that contain a minimal amount of sugar will be healthy and choices. Enjoy. Many people also have plain, textural preferences: raspberry, strawberry, or grape jelly, smooth, crunchy, unsalted peanut. So, what do you think his objective was? What do you think he wanted more than anything else? Objectives are the best when they when you need it more than anything in the world, right? It has to be the most important thing in that moment. That's what gives us urgency, that's what gives us stakes. If it's important to the professor, it will follow that it will be important to the students, right? So he wants it. Um, did you say that you wanted them to make one for you? And bring two, or was that me? No, to you. That was me. <laughs> I'm really hungry. Okay, so um, good. What did you say your objective was? Um, uh, to have them make a peanut butter Have them make it right now. Right Go now, leave the class. Make it. Storm the best deal. Perfect. Yes. What do you think his first tactic was? To level with? What else? To float? To amuse? What did you say? I would have coddle. To coddle. Sometimes they do need that. Mm. Okay, his second tactic. What did you think that was? To stack, to press, cut, slice, slash, thrust. I, 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 I identify it as to inspire. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I, if I were directing his lecture, right, if I were to critique him, I would have told him to inspire is a little bit vague, and actually some of you came up with things that were more specific, but Carl has been acting for a very long time. And so he knows what he wants. Like when he says to inspire, he can make that specific. Um, if I were dealing with an introductory student, I would say to inspire how? What are you going to do to inspire them? Um, that does bring up something else I wanted to say. When, when good actors or experienced actors go into a scene, they're not spending the whole scene thinking about what is my tactic now? What is my objective for the whole scene? They've done their homework, they've rehearsed it enough, so that hopefully it should become second nature to them, so too will this happen to you as a professor, right? This is, these are tools for you. These are vocabulary for you to use to make more interesting lectures, to make yourself more at ease in front of a group of students. And it's the same thing with actors. They're tools that they use, which eventually sort of fade away as it becomes part of what they naturally do as a character in the scene. And it would be the same thing for, for a professor. I don't go into every single lecture and say, ah, what's my tactic now? But I know myself well enough to know when a tactic
tactic doesn't seem to be working for what I'm radiating and receiving from the group of students, but I can shift and do something different. I change my space in the room, I change the way I'm approaching static, or I change the tactic itself. And when you learn sort of a, any sort of new skill or any new technique, when you first work on it, it is a, it's something you have to think about. Um, eventually it will become sort of instinctive. That's what happens with actors. Beginning actors, when they're training, you can see their minds working. You can watch them act as they go, oh, oh yeah, I'm supposed to do this now, and they will focus on that. You're very aware of the process of how they do it. Um, hopefully by the time they get to performance, we're just focused on the product, on what it is that they're doing. And so the more, the more instinctive this becomes, the more habitual, you do those things automatically, so you don't have to think about them. And the great thing that you can take away from this, too, is if you always come back to that breathing and being still, if you find that you are just talking, talking to your students, it's the same lecture you've given for the past 15 years on the same topic, and they're falling asleep, right? Breathe, be still, and remember, what am I doing? What do I want from them? And what is my active verb that's going to help me get it, right? Or if it's something new that you're teaching them, and you, all of a sudden you have this moment where you're like, what have you been doing? So breathe and be still, what do I want? And how can I actively pursue that? Make it about them, it's not about you. Right? Come back to that objective. What, do I, what am I doing? What do I want? What do I need? And what can I do to make them get it? What was your last? Um, uh, does anybody have any, any questions, either anything we covered today or on the idea of a, kind of applying the idea of performance to being a professor? Mm -hmm. Carl, I know you taught online last summer. Oh. What did you do there? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, I'm a big fan of Panopto lectures. Um, a very short, do, I do a lot of really short ones um, that I do in that way. I, I think the challenge there is figuring out how you shift your, your tactics of teaching. Um, and so there you think about it kind of in a broader sense of what tools do I use in order to reach them. And so am I going to use discussion board as a way of engaging them intellectually? Um, I used a Facebook closed group as a way of uh, engaging them uh, emotionally about what it is that we were talking about. And I divided it very specifically in that way. Um, and so it's, it's really thinking about, I also have them uh, uh, create videos uh, themselves presenting the material. Um, so it, it forces them to engage with each other, I think, in those different ways as well. I think it, it, it forces you to think about what are the different ways that they can, that you can transform them, change them, impact them, and get them to uh, engage with the material, with each other, and with you uh, in, in ways that they you can't because you don't have that face to face. And all of those are, are very tactics, right? They're not tactics like what we were dealing with in a monologue, right? In this peanut butter and jelly monologue. But what's important is as a professor too and as an actor, the more tactics you have and the more varied they are, the more people you're going to reach. And it's the same thing as an actor in a scene. The more tactics a character can employ and the more varied those tactics are, the better chance they have of achieving their objective. So too is it with a professor. The more tactics you have to reach the maximum number of students, the more chance you have of achieving your objectives. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I tend to overuse my hands a lot, uh, both as an actor and as a professor. Um, <laughs> the more that you breathe, uh, getting back to that idea of being in control of the space, breathing and being still, um, when you're consciously thinking about that, you tend to use your hands less. Um, we tend to use our hands when we want to help clarify what it is that we're saying. If we just give it a little bit of an extra oomph, they'll get it. Um, and I think it's trusting your material, trusting what's going on um, intellectually, uh, trusting your persuasive abilities in that way, usually that will then calm your your hand gestures and your physical need to support what it is that you're saying, as it can get to be distracting.
your I teach the moving body. That's another course that I teach. Your physicality is in itself a tactic. So it really becomes about a, if you catch yourself, right? Um, breathe and be still and ask, is this adding value to the lecture or is it distracting? I'll tell you the things that are that almost never work. Pacing almost never works. Unless you are pacing with a purpose. Right? Pacing almost never works. And the flail almost never works unless they just think you're hilarious and charming. Um, <laughs> but, but direct and specific physicality and hand gestures can work. It's all about, but again, going back to that idea of specificity. The more specific you are with your choices, um, if you do that, then you will have less superfluous gestures. Okay? Thank you very much. Enjoy lunch. Keep on enjoying.